Thanks a lot for, um, uh, for coming to my talk. I want to talk a little bit about the AI re uh, revolution, what it means uh, for open source, open society, and also specifically for like an, uh, an open source project like Nextcloud. So a little bit about me. I'm actually doing open source for a long, long time. It's close to 25 years now. Um, for a long time, I was part of the, oops, part of the KID community. We have a board member. Um, I am um, in, was invited as an expert at the W3C, where I helped to create the activity pub standard, um, and fellow of Open Source Forum Euro, where I tried to lobby a little bit for open source in the, for the European for, um, um, Commission, European Union. Then I'm helping the United Nations with the open source strategy, but I'm probably invited here as founder and CEO of uh, Nextcloud. So I want to first talk a little bit about Nextcloud, what it is, very briefly, no worries, but I think it's important for the context. Then about this ethical AI framework that we created, uh, about the Nextcloud Assistant, and at the end about this term open source AI, which was also covered by the talk before, which is a very interesting topic. <laughs> I don't have an answer. I'm already spoiling that. <laughs> okay, so what is Nextcloud? Um, Nextcloud is, uh, as a, when, I, when I try to describe it, I will start with this graphic. This is a bit like, a, like the history here. Um, at the, well, you cannot really see anything. Interesting. It worked before, right? Let me try to unplug and plug in again. Yeah, there it is, awesome. Great, always unplug and plug in again, that fixes everything. Um, so describe Nextcloud, I always use this uh, graphic here. Um, on the bottom you see a little bit our, what I call our grandfather, that's the file server, you know it from the 80s and from the 90s. Then came FileSync and Share. That's, uh, this is software that can, um, that you know from Dropbox and Google Drive and OneDrive and so on, which has mobile access and web interfaces and encryption and versioning and so on. But at the end of the day, what we all want and use is collaboration software. So that's software that we can be used to work together between organizations, teams, people over the internet. Um, and yeah, the major um, players here, obviously Microsoft 365, Google Workspace, and also what we call Nextcloud Hub. Um, so our product is Nextcloud Hub. We have structured in these four pieces. We have Nextcloud Files for file sync and share. Then talk for chat and video conferencing, like you can imagine as an open source Teams. Groupware for mail calendar contacts and Office for document editing. Okay, so you might wonder, okay, you've seen this before. Slack has it, Dropbox has it, um, Microsoft has it, Google has it, what's the difference? Well, the difference is that this is all open source and we as Nextcloud host nothing. You can go to our website, download all of that, put it on your Raspberry Pi, on your Linux server, something, and you have your local collaboration suite with all the features. You can have your own um, group chats, you can have your own video conferencing, mail, o and office document editing, and so on. So this is basically everything is open source and on-premise what we do. Then like a few screenshots that you can imagine it. Um, that's the file sync and share part. It's just a file manager. You can upload and download files tag them, search them, um, share them with others, and so on. That's the interface for the group chat. You can also do video calling. You can post in files, edit it together, do polls, to mention people, and so on. I have mobile apps too, of course. That's the calendar. So we can have a shared calendar in your organization, again, host it on your own machine. You don't have to give your data to Google or Microsoft or others. There's a mail interface for encrypted mail, and tagging and um, send later features and so on. And then there is an office suite for editing office documents in the browser, collaborative, different people together in the same document with different cursors. So that's what we do. We are like the open source alternative to Microsoft 365, Google Workspace, Slack, Dropbox, and so on. And this is all used by um, all kinds of organizations from the European Commission, to the International Red Cross from Amnesty International, um, American Mobile in Mexico for 20 million users, German government, Swedish government, and so on and so on. So that's what we do, and that's what we built, and life was great, and end of last year, and everything was good. And then came AI, and this really changed a lot of things. So. 
first of all, it moved, put me into a little bit of a depression because I thought, okay, we are all building these great open source tools here and uh, we are empowering people to control their data and their privacy and everything. And now we have this technology which is obviously super powerful, but it's in the hand of a few big organizations. And that's a big problem. So we as open source community have no way to compete. Luckily, it only took a few weeks became, and until it became clear that there is actually a way for us to compete. So a little bit more about it later. So we at Nextcloud, we believe that our tools and our software should empower people. We should make all of us more productive, get our work done to really be a great assistant. And this is, of course, something that computers do, that open source can do, that AI can do, and this really has a lot of power to make all our lives easier. The problem is that there's also a dark side of AI. Right? I think you, um, I'm sure you all followed the news. It is from um, discrimination to questions about the CO2 footprint, questions about who has actually access to this data, um, and lots of other concerns like privacy and so on. And this is something that really goes through the press. Um, a lot of organizations are concerned about it. I'm sure you all read the news that organizations like Samsung or Apple or Goldman Sachs, um, many others, they actually banned the use of ChatGPT because they're concerned about privacy um, um, yeah, issues and other problems. So this really put us as Nextcloud a little bit into a dilemma because we want to use the latest technologies. We want to make the software as good as possible, as open source, as privacy respecting and so on. But of course, we have our ethical standards. We cannot just like, I don't know, integrate ChatGPT in everything and then all the data is like leaking. That's not really what we want to do. So beginning of the year, when it became clear that there is a way for us to compete with the big tech companies, we created an ethical AI framework because we wanted to rate all the things we are doing and all the things our other doing and empower our people to make the right decisions about which AI features to use and what not. Of course, ethical is a big word, right? It's a bit <laughs> not really clear what it means. So what is ethical in AI in our definition? So it's, it was actually not so hard because you just need to read the news and you basically saw the big concerns that people had regarding AI. The first is discrimination, right? Is this really, um, are these large language models really um, free of bias? Or is it something that really like amplifies like um, problems in our societies, which is of course uh, a problem because we really care about diversity and inclusiveness and these black boxes, these large language models, um, this can be a problem in this regard. Second potential problem is of course the CO2 footprint. Right? You know that we need all these huge server farms to create these large language models. It really increases the power consumption and increases the CO2 footprint, which is obviously a problem. Next thing is privacy, the privacy question. So this is actually interesting um, because why did these companies like Samsung and Apple and others like ban ChatGPT? Well, it's not only because the data is submitted to a different uh, company, which is on its own already problematic, but it's not completely unusual because sometimes maybe you use a cloud service, which also means you give your data to someone else. But the interesting thing here is that these companies often use your data to train machine learning models. And it's actually possible that if you use ChatGPT to, I don't know, discuss like a confidential document, some new, I don't know, marketing concept or construction plans of an airplane or something, then if this data is used there, and if your competitor is also in ChatGPT, might get answers that are based on your data. So that's obviously a big privacy problem. And then last um, but not least, um, the big question about being freely available. Right? I mean, a big topic here in the open source community is that we build technology that's available by, for everybody. Even people who are like, I don't know, live in Africa who don't really have a lot of money, but they can still use all our nice open source tools. <coughs> So these are big concerns um, regarding um, AI. So what we did then, we created this OM ethical AI framework. And it 
boils down to these three requirements. Let me explain um, why this is. First is we think that the open source code should be uh, sorry, the source code should be open source and freely available. Why is this important? Because only then you can actually look inside and see what's happening there. And by the way, this is source code for um, creating a model, for training the model, but also like interfering, like using a model, so both of it. Because only if the source code is freely available, you can see what's going on. And you can then also optimize it, for example, to reduce the CO2 footprint, right? If you just use uh, AI systems out of the cloud, you don't even know what's happening. So if the source code is um, open source, you really know what's going on. Second is the models should be freely available. Why is this important? Because if they're freely available, you can actually run them locally. And if you run them locally, you know that no data is leaking anywhere else. Right? As you know, there are some models like the LAMA models that can run locally and others like GBT4 not. So that's a big question. And the third requirement is that we think that the training data should be freely available. So why is that? Because only if the training data is freely available, you can check if there's any bias in there. And if there's bias in there, you can actually um, change it and improve it. If you don't have the training data, then it's just a black box, which is not good. So what we then created is this traffic light system between green and red, um, depending how many of these requirements are fulfilled. And we have a scale there and we rated all kinds of systems that we developed ourselves and other systems that are coming from somewhere else. Just to give you an example, something like ChatGPT is obviously red because none of those three requirements are fulfilled. So what we then did inside Nextcloud is we give, gave people a choice. So with every feature, you have the option to configure what you want to do. For example, you can see here on top, there's a setting for translations. So if you want to use a translation um, feature, you can choose if you want to use ChatGPT for that, or you can use the Opus model developed by the University of Helsinki, which is similar good, and it can run completely local and open source on your own machine. And you can really choose what you want. Same is with the speech to text. You can use a hosted uh, whisper service if you want, or you can also run it locally if you prefer it. And the same for text processing and all the other features. So we give our users control if they want to use like local models, local services, which use a lot, a little bit more hardware obviously, or something that comes out of the cloud. But obviously we as Nextcloud, we focus on the open source and local AI. So what we developed during this year was something that we called a Nextcloud Assistant. Actually it was released four weeks ago, so it's relatively new. So this is an assistant which is built into Nextcloud. It's using a large language model. It's 100% open source and it's fully self-hosted. And we believe that we are actually the first one uh, in the world who have this power of this AI um, as assistant features but running completely local. Because all the other um, competitors from Zoom to Slack to Teams and so on are obviously SaaS sol solutions out of the cloud and well, you might not trust that too much. So what can it do? I'll give you some examples. Um, it can do face recognition, object recognition of images. It can be dictation, translation. It can recommend resources. It can have a um, sort your emails in a smart way um, and lots of other things. I'll give you a few more detailed examples here. It's if you press the assistant button in Nextcloud, you get like a window with a chat interface where you can then chat with the system and ask for generation of um, images or texts and so on. And if you want, this can run completely local. There is like a system where you can swap out different LLMs at the, at the back end. Uh, this works fine with the Llama models, this works fine with the Falcon models or the, with, the, um, yeah, with the latest models, um, which is completely abstracted and quite nice. Another feature is, of course, that you can use it for text generation. Let's say you want to have an email and you don't really want to know how to write an invitation for your birthday party. You can say, hey, I want to have an invitation to a birthday party and it generates an email for you completely automatic. Or if you work with text inside Nextcloud, you can just mark a text at any place and say, hey, um, on the side menu, I want to summarize it, I want to have it longer or shorter or translate to a different language or whatever you want. And again, 
this completely runs completely local and no data is uh, leaking anywhere else. Or if you want to have a contract, you can use um, Nextcloud Office, just select the button, you can choose what you want to do, draft me an employment contract, for example, and it generates a contract for you. Again, features that you might know from Google or Microsoft, but again, this runs local. Or if you want to have an image, for example, you're in a group conversation with your, uh, with your colleagues from the market team, for example, and you want to visualize something, you can put in a prompt and it generates a picture and puts it directly into the chat, which can be quite nice and powerful. Or if you want to dictate your emails, there's a locally running whisper service available and you can just dictate your emails or your chat messages or whatever. Um, this can also be used for creating transcripts of video calls. So you can have a automatically generate a transcript of all your video calls if you want. Again, also automatically summarized if you prefer that. And again, I think we're the only ones who do this as open source and local. The assistant can also use in chat conversations. Let's say you have a group chat conversation and you're discussing, I don't know, the next event here where you want to go. At any time you can say just add assistant and ask a question, like for example here, what is important for um, organizing an event? And the assistant gives you the, gives you the output here. What's interesting here is that um, we are experimenting here not only with a normal LLM, um, but this is also something that can be combined with a vector database and a tool called Langchain, which means that this LLM can actually work based on your local data. So you can ask questions about, hey, what are the latest emails about this customer? What are, what's our biggest uh, revenue, like last quarter? Um, and query all kinds of information that's completely local. Again, this is something that also Microsoft and Google announced, but in their case, of course, you have to upload all your chat messages, your emails, your files and everything to them. In this case, this um, stays on your machine. And you can also do things like summarizing email threads. You all know that, of course. That's something that uh, can be quite uh, painful if you have a lot of conversation, and then you get a nice summary here. But of course, there are also like other features, um, machine learning models. Um, for example, this one analyzes the login behavior. So it an analyzes like, hey, this user never logs in in the middle of the night from a different continent. Something is weird here. So you can trigger two-factor authentication or send out a warning or does something else. And then the last thing that I have example here, it can also do cl um, document classification. For example, it can detect if a document has probably some confidential data inside, bank information, social security numbers, other things, and you can automatically then tag these documents as with a special tag as confidential, and then this administrator can configure, hey, files that are tagged with confidential should like not be shared, like, I don't know, outside our internal IP space or to a user in a special LDAP group or something like that. So these are the features um, that we developed as, uh, as open source and completely running locally, which again, as I said, just a year ago, I was quite depressed because I thought that's just not possible but I'm really, really happy about the power of the open source community that really shows that all of that is possible to run locally. Okay, so this was a bit of the Nextcloud perspective here, but um, of course the question here, what is happening here in our world is um, also a little bit um, bigger. And there is the question around open source AI that pops up. Again, I don't really have an answer here, just some thoughts that I want to share. Um, so I think that our ethical AI framework actually has some interesting thoughts about that. So the three requirements that a code should be open source, that um, the machine learning model should be freely available and the training data should be freely available. This, I think, maps quite nicely into the definition of free software and open source, I think. Um, so, for example, if you look into the four freedoms, this is obviously the definition or part of the free software uh, definition. Right? Then you have these four freedoms that um, Richard Stallman obviously postulated. Uh, the first one is the freedom to run the program as you wish for any purpose. I think if you check this with um, AI, this means 
that you should be able to use this AI system as you want for any purpose as you want, which I think requires that you have access to the model and you should be able to run it locally or in the cloud. So I think this matches quite nicely to this requirement. The second one is to study how the program works and change it um, so it, um, to, change, uh, to change it so it does your computing as you wish, exactly. So you should be able to check what it does and you should be able to modify it. So this is interesting. What does a modifying AI mean? Right? It basically means, it can be, uh, mean fine tuning, but I think at the end of the day it, should, it means that you should have all the building blocks available, which is the training data and the software. Obviously, you need a lot of hardware for that. That's something that hope hopefully it gets easier in the future. But if you have the training data and the weights and the uh, software available, then you can basically play with it and create your own LLM as you wish. So I think this also matches nicely to these requirements. Then the freedom to redistribute copies um, to help, help your neighbor. Obviously, this comes from the time where it uh, distributes software via floppy disks. Um, a little bit different nowadays. But it also means, of course, that a model should be freely available. And the question is, of course, which means freely here. I mean, I guess some kind of creative comments or something that it can be shared with others. Um, and then, of course, also the freedom to distribute copies of your modified version. So I think these three requirements, suddenly, this was not really the attention uh, early this year, but matches actually to the four freedoms of the Free Software Foundation. Then if you look at the open source definition, that's like the alternative definition comes from the OSI, which um, really has the same spirit, just with different words. Um, it's the first one is free redistribution. Again, it should be possible to take the model and the software and everything that's needed to run it and freely um, redistribute it. Again, I think it means software open source and the model also somehow some creative commons, I don't know, some license that allows that. The source code here, of course, um, the derived works. Um, the integra integra I cannot have time to go through everything, I'm sorry for that. But I can already see that most of the requirements actually match um, the three requirements that I presented earlier. Um, also here, for example, no discrimination against persons or groups. Very interesting point too. Um, of course, it meant here that you should not, should not have a software license that basically permits someone to use your software. But in the case of AI, discrimination, of course, has a bigger question here. And again, it requires complete transparency and only with the training data and everything available, you can be make sure that there's no discrimination in there. So I think I want to, I mean, also in the workshop tomorrow of the OSI, um, but I want to propose um, that something like these three requirements actually could be something that could be the basis of some kind of open source um, definition. Um, there are some people who think that something like the Llama model or the Falcon model are also open source because you can just use it and do what you want. But for me, this would be free as in beer, I have to say. This means, okay, great, there's a tool I can download from the internet, I can play with it, awesome. But what you don't really have is like control, like how it's built, you cannot reproduce it, you cannot really modify it, you cannot really make it better, you cannot really study it, so this is missing. And from that perspective, the training data, I think, is also uh, mandatory. Which brings me to the end, to the summary. So takeaways from my point of view is, Ethical AI is possible. It is not needed. That AI means ChatGPT, which is a black box on the internet. It is possible that free, uh, we as open source community are still in control of that. We can, we can steer the ship into the direction we want. We have the tools and we have the knowledge. And if the license basically guarantees um, that we can use all of that, then the open source community is not outdated, but we can actually have an impact in making the IT world um, better. Local and open source IT without data leakage is possible. Again, something that I did not thought it's possible a year ago, but it totally is. Like most of the features I just presented run, run totally fine on a Raspberry Pi. It's not true that you need a supercomputer just for interference. So it's really possible to run it locally. Um, we can actually work on reducing the CO2 footprint. Obviously, initially, it still takes a lot of power 
but we have the building blocks in, in, in our hands and we can optimize and we can really improve it, we can measure it. We cannot really measure what BART or ChatGPT or other systems you, um, um, consume, but with our tools we can measure it and that's very important. The bias here is something that we can really detect and fight um, if you have all the building blocks in place. Um, but I think that an evolved open source definition is needed and I think I'm uh, repeating myself here too much, <laughs> but uh, tomorrow is this uh, big workshop here and uh, everybody is of course invited and I think we should do this to make sure that we as open source community are in the position to shape the future.